Good morning, everyone. Um, so welcome to Inquiring Minds Want to Know How Wikipedia is Unlocking Scientific Knowledge. Um, I'm Helene Blumenthal, and I'm the Classroom Program Manager at the Wiki Education Foundation. Um, in case you don't know who we are, we are a small nonprofit organization um, based in, in San Francisco. That's where Samantha and I are, are talking to you from today. Um, and our broad mission is to connect the worlds of academia and Wikipedia. And so um, you're going to be hearing from myself and two other people today who I'll introduce uh, momentarily. Um, so after the presentation, we will have a, a Q&A session. So if you have questions, um, type it into the Q&A box. Um, you should be able to access that. If you're having other, if you're having other issues, you can type into the chat. Um, if you're not seeing the chat, uh, that means you're probably not running the latest version of, of Zoom. So only the latest version has the webinar chat. Um, so if you're not seeing it, the chat, that is, that's the reason why. Um, as Samantha mentioned, um, you guys uh, don't, we, we don't see or hear, or hear you, but you can type into the Q&A box and you can do that throughout the presentation as questions, um, you know, come up for you and then we can get to them at the end of the presentation. Um, so, yeah, let me make some introductions. So again, I'm Helene Blumenthal, um, and essentially I, I oversee the major program here at the organization, and that's called the Classroom Program, and that's where we support professors in the U.S. and Canada um, whose students are contributing to Wikipedia as, as an assignment in, the, in their courses. We're going to talk about that program a little bit more um, later uh, later in the presentation, but essentially we are supporting hundreds of classes um, and thousands of students each term. This is Samantha Wield. Samantha is our outreach manager here at the Wiki Education Foundation. So um, Samantha deals with recruitment, um, but she's also responsible for working with uh, first-time professors in the classroom program. And then let me introduce Dr. Becky Carmichael. Um, uh, Becky is a science coordinator, um, communications across the curriculum at Louisiana State University. Um, Becky is a longtime professor in the classroom program, and um, she is an expert in science communication. So we are grateful that Becky is joining us today. All right, so let's so let's let's move on here to the to the meat of this presentation. Um, so so on the face of it. Um, information can be shared and accessed by millions in, in just moments. Um, despite this reality, though, there still exists a pretty wide gulf between um, scientific expertise and public knowledge. Um, and it's not that these two groups of people, scientists and the public, are at odds with one another, quite to the contrary. Um, the, the public is really yearning for good scientific, scientific information, and the scientific community has a, really, has a real vested interest in a public that is well informed in the sciences. Um, but despite these intersecting goals, um, there's still a pretty wide gap between um, between the two, between, between scientific expertise and, and public access. And so first let's look at what, what's behind that, that gap. And so there's a variety of different things at play. So the first thing is, is that you know, many scientists just don't have the communication skills to share their highly specialized knowledge with a lay audience. Um, and unfortunately, um, communication is not, uh, readily taught as part of master and doctoral programs um, you know as scientists are, are early in their careers and just like any other skill um, it needs to be honed and practiced so so at, at a very basic level um, many scientists just don't have those communication skills necessary to make their expertise available to a wider audience so so that's the first thing um, a second thing is, is career advancement. So a recent Pew study um, showed that only 37% of scientists see sharing their, um, their research, their expertise with the greater public as important for their careers. Um, so that means that more than half of you know, the scientific community doesn't see sharing their, their expertise, sharing their research as something that's gonna help them in their career. So it's not a part of their tenure. It's not um, a part of getting funding. So it's just something that falls down you know, low on the list of priorities. Another critical factor at play 
is that a lot of scientific information is behind paywalls. So it's in journals and specialized publications that you need subscriptions to access. So it's only available to a small number of, of people that are already kind of in the know. And so when the general public does get scientific, scientific information, it's often coming from the mainstream media, so that's the internet, news outlets, and, you know, and TV. And you know, the this, this same Pew study showed that three quarters of scientists think that infor scientific information that comes from the mainstream media is unreliable or inaccurate. So, so what to do? Can we, you know, can we bridge this this chasm between, um, you know, between these two groups, between scientists and the public at large? And so, um, you know, it seems a little bit bleak at first. Um, the same the same study showed that um, 85 85 percent of scientists um, think that the public's lack of scientific knowledge is a real impediment to scientific progress. But but there's there's some glimmers of hope here. So. Um, um, so 70% of the population, though, um, of the general population, really believes that scientists contribute to the well-being of society, and 90% of the population has some degree of trust in the country's scientific leadership. And that's a number that's actually remained pretty steady since the 1970s. Um, where trust in, say, politicians or religious institutions, industry, the news, has actually declined um, pretty steadily since then. So, um, so the question here is really, um, it's, not lack of, it's not lack of desire on, on either side's part, but it's how do scientists share their information, um, share their expertise in a way that's comprehensible to the public, and how does the public know where to find that information? And so there's a variety of different solutions to this problem. Um, th this is something that I think a, a, a lot of people are recognizing that it has to be addressed, and a lot of different things are being tried. So for example, town halls, um, movements to create citizen scientists, um, just better funding for science education, and then of course making science communications, you know, a regular part of any scientist um, training. But today we're going to talk to you about Wikipedia, so the world's largest encyclopedia, and we're going to talk to you about how Wikipedia is in a kind of an ideal solution um, to kind of to bridging the gap between scientific expertise and access. So, bef yeah, so before we get into that, we're gonna just do a little bit of a poll, a quick poll question for you guys. Um, so hopefully you should be able to see this, but um, I'll read it. Um, what percentage of the population do you think uses the internet to access scientific information? So your choices are 25%, 50%, or 75%. And we'll give you a I'll give you guys 30 seconds 30 or so seconds to reply. Seven, yeah. Just, just for fun, just to see what everyone. Yeah, thinks. just to see, just to see what you think the number is. So I know that you guys can't see the poll replies, and that's uh, a feature of Zoom. That I think that's a little unfortunate because I can see as the live data is coming yeah. in. And so what we're seeing is that the the three options are 20% um, of the population, 50% of the population, or 75% of the population. And right now, uh, the replies are. 10% of you think that 20% of the population um, uses the internet to access science and technology information. 50%, 30% uh, think that 50% of the public <laughs> a lot of is, yeah, is using the internet to access science information. And 75% of you think that the public is using, 75% uh, of the public is using the internet to access science information. Okay. So I'm going to end the poll. And uh, we'll, we'll yeah, so, so yeah, so so the answer is fifty percent. So yeah, so um, this is this is according to um, a, a twenty fourteen study um, reported by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So in twenty fourteen, fifty percent of people said that they use the internet. Um, for uh, science, you know, to find out scientific information, and that number has actually likely grown even quite a bit since then. Um, and that a third of those people say that they use a search engine like Google to get that information. So what happens when you do that Google search? Well, one of your top hits is almost always Wikipedia, if not your if not your your top hit. Um, so 
people are going to Wikipedia for scientific information. And so what does Wikipedia offer? Well, it offers a few different things right off the bat. So number one, it's a familiar, um, it's familiar to people. So at this point, um, most people, many, many people are using Wikipedia as a regular source of, of all sorts of information, um, not just science information. Um, second thing, Wikipedia is a site that anyone can edit. So if you're a scientist, if you're an expert in any, any field, and you think, and you find a Wikipedia article that you think is inaccurate um, or could use improvement, you can do that um, with good, you know, with the right sources of information. You can just hit that edit button and make that change right away. Um, lastly, Wikipedia is free. So there, there are no subscriptions. Um, you know, no special access required to read the more than 5 million articles um, just on the English Wikipedia alone. And so Wikipedia is not without its challenges. Um, so number one, you know, despite the fact that Wikipedia is used regularly by the public and by experts alike, there's still some opposition um, to it, reluctance to accept it within academic circles. Um, so that, that still lingers even today. Um, secondly, and this goes back to the career, you know, the career advancement issue, um, you know, experts can't put, you know, that they contributed to Wikipedia down on their CV readily, you know, in the same way that they can if they contribute, you know, to a peer-reviewed journal publication. So, again, um, because of that sort of lack of, of career advancement, um, scientists or, or experts are less motivated to contribute to Wikipedia. And then lastly, um, there is a learning curve when learning how to contribute to Wikipedia. So there are some basic ins and outs that one, you know, needs to know to make good contributions to Wikipedia. And so that acts as a, an additional barrier. Some people just don't want to take the time to to learn how to do that. So, so this is actually where we come in, where the Wiki Education Foundation comes in. So what we have found is maybe we can't get experts to contribute, but what we can, who we can get to contribute are students. So as I mentioned earlier, we have our classroom program, which is our largest program here at the organization. And that's where students um, in the US and Canada contribute to Wikipedia as, a, as an assignment in their course. Um, and so what happens here is that these students, they're definitely motivated to do it because they have to, <laughs> it's part of their grade. Um, but what happens is they're being guided by the experts in their field. So those experts can say, you know, here are the articles in this field, so in, you know, the, the subject of the course that they're taking that need improvement. And so as the experts, you know, they know best which articles need improvement. And then they can guide those students toward the best sources of information um, as experts in their field. So we're really getting that scientific expertise to guide these, these students um, toward their contributions. So um, now I'm going to pass things on to my colleague, Samantha, who is going to talk to you specifically about um, our Year of Science initiative and how students are improving scientific information on Wikipedia. Yeah, so the Wikied launched in 2016 our Year of Science initiative, and this is an initiative to work with um, students around the United States and Canada to improve their science communication skills in their classes, all while improving Wikipedia and its coverage of scientific information. And I'm going to kind of deep dive into what that looks like from our perspectives. But just to start um, with some numbers, what can students do in the, what, it's been nine months now, or October, it's been 10 months almost, that we've been running the Year of Science. We've worked with um, 4,500 students across 266 courses. Those students together as a cohort have added two and a half million words to Wikipedia in the sciences to improve the site. They've contributed to almost 3,000 new articles on Wikipedia and created 265 new entries, so topics where there was not already an article that they improved. Um, and their work has been viewed almost 84 million times. So again, just more numbers showing that people use Wikipedia to access science knowledge, just in case you weren't quite comprehending. <laughs> 
how incredible it is. And we, we did some, um, some calculations and what we found is that when students were in the busiest part of their semester in the spring term, in the month of April, our students contributed 6% of all the new science content contributed to Wikipedia. Um, and that's a pretty incredible amount of content. 6% of all new science content contributed came from our students. So they're making a really incredible impact. Um, but what do these numbers, you know, really mean? And, and what does it look like when a student makes a contribution? So if you have a student who is working on an article about ion chromatography, what might their contribution look like? So this is an article that already existed. This is a before shot of the article. It's pretty good. It's a comprehensive review of the subject. It has history. It has the principles. It's covering some problems and uses. But what we found is that this student actually took this article from having four references to having 43 references. This student really contributed, the article went from seven sections to 12, they added new content about membrane exchange. Um, and so what they're doing is they're deep diving into a subject that's relevant to their course. They're learning about the history of the topic, but they're also working on their communication skills and thinking, well, how can I communicate my learning through Wikipedia to a general audience? Um, that's an, one example of what our students can do. Another great example, oh yeah, we go to the references section here. Another great example, this is a student who worked on the geobiology article. So this is a student that we worked with who, when she was considering where to go to get her master's and her PhD, she applied to a geobiology program and she kind of thought to herself, well, what exactly is geobiology and should I be studying this? And she went to the Wikipedia article and what she found was this, this article here, not a very comprehensive review of the subject a one sentence lead section that says, you know, geobiology is an interdisciplinary field. Um, and, you know, lucky for us, she did decide to pursue that program. But as part of her, um, her graduate studies, she actually asked her advisor if she could improve the Wikipedia article and really bring more information about their field to Wikipedia. And what she did was completely revamp the article. So this is just a screenshot of the top part of the page. This student added almost 4,000 words to the article um, and really just made it, again, a comprehensive review of what is a new field and included graphs and images and history and methodologies. And if you want to go to the geobiology article on Wikipedia, I would encourage you because it's an incredible piece of work. Um, so that's another great example. We also have students who create new articles where there wasn't already an article. So this article on Soviet rocketry is part of a Cold War science course that we supported. And this student um, basically added 4,000 words created a brand new article about Soviet rocketry and the history of that and it was um, a really interesting study of of how you can take history and science and really merge it into what becomes really useful information for Wikipedia and then the last uh, oh yeah this is I'm scrolling down the page so you can see kind of all the things that they added 47 references there I'm um, a whole bibliography beyond that I mean a really incredible contribution to Wikipedia as well as to their own learning and then one last example that we have for you today is ethnic conflict uh, an article that was improved by a student and this student took the article from six sections which we can see here which includes information about uh, regulation post cold war world um, theories of ethnic conflict and and actually kind of improved it to being a really comprehensive review 16 sections of content so we're able to see that the student really added information about continued to expand upon the theories of ethnic conflict. They added content, they added you know, 21 references to the article, and really, um, again, made it a really incredible bibliography. <laughs> um, so some other things that happen with the students that we work with is, is even outside the classroom. So we, we have a uh, partnership with the UCSF medical program to work with medical students as they contribute to medical content on Wikipedia. And you know, 200 million people uh, you know, go to Wikipedia to receive medical content. And one way that we can visualize this as this really interesting graph, um, a, a study done by an instructor in our program called James Heilman, who's also um, a physician. And what he did was he wanted to look at page view content and see how many people are accessing science information in the medical field on Wikipedia. And what he found is that people were more likely to go to Wikipedia for medical content than the National Institute of Health, than WebMD, than the Mayo Clinic, 
than NHS and more than the World Health Organization. And this is despite knowing that Wikipedia is supposedly more unreliable than these other sources. Um, and so our partnership with the University of California, San Francisco medical program is to work with fourth year medical students as they work to improve uh, medical content on Wikipedia. And the 43 articles that the students have contributed to during the course of this project have been seen 22 million times um, across across the Wikipedia's mobile and desktop sites, and that's a pretty incredible, uh, pretty incredible contribution. Students have contributed to articles such as HIV and pregnancy, to opioid overdose, ovarian torsion, to hepatitis. Um, we also have pharmaceutical students who are working on this project at UCSF, and those students are also working to contribute to the fundamental understanding of medical science and the way that it's accessed on something like Wikipedia. So the future of these doctors who are going to become, these individual students who are going to become future doctors are getting instilled in them um, an appreciation for communicating their learning for their patients and for people who are beyond the scope of their work. Um, we also have a great initiative to improve the coverage of women in science on Wikipedia. And um, this is a really crucial, we believe, at Wikied in, in working in our Year of Science initiative. So imagine that you're a young woman who's coming to Wikipedia who wants to learn about somebody in your field who looks like you. And um, the, you know, the chances are that you're not going to find that information. And there's a couple problems and, and reasons why this happens. Um, about 85% of Wikipedia's editors are men. So this creates um, a content gap where those individuals are editing around topics that they're passionate about, things that they really have an interest in. And usually what that looks like is people who look and think like you. Um, the other problem that we see is that about 85% of the biographies on Wikipedia are about men. So we know that women are 50% of the world and we want to encourage our students in all disciplines, but specifically in the sciences, to really create, um, to create the history of their field and incorporate women into that. And so we have some really great examples of what students are doing in the program. Um, we have students um, working on biographies of women in science to create role models for future scientists. And a couple of the great examples that we have today are Eugenia Clark, who was a pioneer in the study of sharks and an early adopter of scuba diving as a research strategy, which is really incredible. She's a marine biologist. And so when if a young marine biologist wants to learn about the women in her field, she's able to learn and access content because of the work that our students are doing to improve Wikipedia. We also have um, really incredible contribution from Mary Bernheim. It was a significantly expanded article, and Bernheim discovered an enzyme that was critical for our understanding of neurobiology and is among Duke University's first women faculty in their medical field. Another great example of uh, work that our students are doing in the program is this article on Caroline Herschel. And um, let's see, I want to make sure I get this right because I don't want to mess anything up. <laughs> so, so Caroline was an 18th century astronomer, and she discovered several comets. And she was the first member of the Royal Astronomical Society, um, which is really incredible. And so again, if you have a young scientist who's looking for a role model in astronomy, we want to make sure that they're able to, to type into Google and say, there were some famous female astronomers and find um, well-referenced, accurate scientific information about that history. And by improving content on these and other women in the sciences, we're not only correcting the historical record, but we're providing concrete examples of successful women scientists that can ultimately give younger generations of women the confidence they need to pursue their own careers. Um, so again, our, our goal with our year of science work is creating a better better science communicators in our students. And we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how students can improve Wikipedia and what this means for public access. Um, but these students can contribute to Wikipedia and more things happen. Not only are they improving Wikipedia, but they're improving their own learning. So our students are able to become consumers of information as well as producers of scientific content. Um, they're thinking about how do, how do I digest this information and, and, and actually take it in? For my own career. They're able to discern reliable from unreliable information. Um, they're thinking about what's accurate and they're thinking about and we're ultimately creating a generation of scientists that are inspired to share their expertise. So hopefully instilling in them a desire and an inspiration to really make an impact and make a difference. 
So for those of you who are joining us today, what can you do? Um, obviously, we would love it if you are an instructor, if you could teach with Wikipedia. If you haven't already thought about it, um, assign students in an upcoming course to do a Wikipedia project to engage in their learning in a new way. If you are an instructor, or even if you are, and you have some spare time and you want to learn how to contribute yourselves, we encourage you to improve your field on Wikipedia. At the end of the day, you are the expert, and you're able to make a much bigger impact like Kalein was saying earlier, to discern what's good and what, what's missing in my field, even more than we are. Um, if you, if you are, are an instructor, if you have a colleague or you have friends, you think this might be interesting to them, this new pedagogical idea of engaging your students in this way, please feel free to refer a colleague. I'd be happy to talk with anybody. And you can always contact us or read more. Um, my email is samantha at wikiedu.org and um, teach.wikiedu.org is a place where you can go to learn more about how do I teach with Wikipedia. All right, so we're going to have one more poll question and then I'm going to switch it over to Becky Carmichael so she can present. I'm going to go ahead and launch my poll. The question for this one is, before the presentation today, did you think of Wikipedia as a good source of scientific information? And I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share there so Becky can go. So go ahead and I'll give you guys about 30 seconds to reply to the poll. Oh wow, we're crushing the poll. So far 100% of you said yes, which I think is really cool. Wow. I'll give it another 10 seconds or so just to let the last few people reply. Samantha, does that look right on your that, end? That looks great, Becky, that looks great. <laughs> All right, so yeah, we've got, um, a hundred percent of respondents <laughs> before today's presentation thought of Wikipedia as a right. good well, source of scientific we are preaching, information. We're preaching to the choir here, but yeah, it's okay. I love it. I love it. Okay, so uh, Dr. Becky Carmichael is a longtime yeah. instructor in our program, and she is here to talk to you about her experiences. So hi, everybody. Um, so what I have to share with you today is um, kind of how I have used Wikipedia since 2011, um, and to share with you, you know, a little bit of the reasons why um, I was using Wikipedia to help develop my students' um, understanding and build their expertise in course content and to help provide them a way to improve their science communication skills. And so specifically what I was really interested in doing is uh, finding a way to facilitate uh, scientific understanding and develop their scientific literacy that extended beyond my classroom. Because as we all know, if they're in the classroom, they're just there for a semester, I only get them for like maybe 16 weeks, and I want to give them skills that transfer beyond that. Um, and so the rest of my slides are just kind of about one, you know, why I do it, and then also giving you some examples of how I do it. Oops. Oh, there we go. <laughs> you heard that, didn't you? Uh -huh. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Okay. Mouse click. Here we go. Okay, so um, as Samantha and Helene have said, you know, Wikipedia is more than just for consuming information. I find it to be a very powerful teaching tool. Um, and so I like to think about course objectives when I'm doing any kind of tool. Um, and here's a list of some of the objectives um, that are typical for many classes. And this list really reflects maybe some that you already have yourself. So when you incorporate a Wikipedia-based assignment, such as a literature review or a critique or feedback um, process, these are some of the, the objectives that can be met. And while meeting those objectives, not only are you helping facilitate uh, the development of course knowledge in the topic you're teaching, but you're also providing and building up that communication um, skill set for your students. Um, with each one of these, objectives. These are all kind of the reasons why I'm using Wikipedia myself. Um, and the way I have done this is kind of just re-emphasizing this idea of skill sets that are transferable. The assignments I'm going to share with you today, uh, it is for my course on disturbance ecology, which is actually called uh, Natural Disturbance and Society, where I teach at LSU um, or Louisiana State University. And so my course is actually for non-science majors. So not only do I have to help my non-science majors develop a foundational understanding of disturbance ecology, but I also have to now make sure that they understand how this science, this particular science, is going to be an integral part of their lives no matter where they live. Um, so I'm doubly charged there. Um, 
on importance of science as well as you know what can I do with it. And I found that Wikipedia would probably be a good place because now they're going to see this is something that uh, a platform that they use already. They probably continue to use this particular platform, but then also it adds back to some of these um, objectives. So they also need to be able to communicate um, effectively. They need to be able to work with others. And so this potentially was my perfect platform. Um, the third kind of piece of, or my charge in incorporating this was also to make sure that my students were comfortable with the platform. And so I developed this project for uh, the entire course, um, which was three parts, these three assignments. And these three assignments I'm sharing you, with you today, you can use them individually, you can use them as a whole, however you'd like to, they're very interchangeable. Um, but the first real small assignment was to make sure my students were comfortable both with the, the technology using Wikipedia, but then also allowing them to become familiar with the topics. And so what we did was my students were, were um, assigned to go to Wikipedia and search for um, different natural disturbance topics um, that we were discussing in class. So earthquakes, fires, flooding, and in this case I'm showing you um, was for invasive species. And so this one allowed them to kind of start learning how to navigate through Wikipedia and the vast content that was there, as we're seeing kind of with this content, the category list for invasive species, but it also was having them connect what we were talking about in class with what others have access to. Um, so during this particular part of the assignment, um, my students were to examine the presentation of the information um, that was available within the articles that were already existed, to examine the writing style, looking for biases, and to look for the references were statements cited, and then were the references that were listed uh, from reliable, peer-reviewed scientific journals, or were they from something else? Also, I should say that all this, for all three assignments, my students were given guidelines and rubrics um, that outlined everything I was looking for, including what was reliability. So, for this particular assignment, um, students went into Wikipedia, and here I've given you two examples of what one of my students did. Um, so this particular student was looking at invasive species, one of my fond loves topics, um, and he decided to do a couple of edits here. So on the top, you can see um, he did some small edits to the Formica Ants um, article, and outlined in blue is the addition that he contributed. So ants in the genus uh, Formica tend to be between four to eight millimeters long. And if you look at the reference, it's from Orkin. Compare that to the second where he added to the Ligodium microfilm article, and in this case, he actually drew content from the scientific journal Plant Ecology. So here was this great opportunity that we could talk about why Orkin may be using this particular information as a company to sell a product versus what goes into the construction and the publication of information that's coming out of a peer-reviewed scientific journal. This also was a point to see how my students were able to start putting in this content within these articles and making sure it was integrated. Um, and I found that, you know, from this just small little quick small edits, students were starting to have these aha moments on, oh, I really need to be careful where I'm getting my information to. So they started to build their literacy. So from assignment one, we moved into actually adding a little bit more content in assignment, or excuse me, from assignment one into assignment two. And so with assignment two, I was looking for my students to now identify an article in which they could make a more substantial contribution, specifically looking for at least, you know, several paragraphs, two to three, up to five paragraphs, or creating a brand new article. My goal is to have my students examine what content already existed and find the missing pieces. So what was the gaps in the knowledge um, that we could help close on Wikipedia to help further someone's understanding on natural disturbance topics? Also, I wanted them to examine existing content and start to translate that scientific information based on the fundamentals that we were learning in the class. And then finally, 
How do you know where to put your content? So with the idea of an encyclopedic writing, it's not to make you as the writer stand out, but more so make your writing and the topic and understanding of that topic stand out and be prominent. So integrating and working to make sure that it's fluent. Now with this particular piece, Students not only had to identify the article and find that missing part, but then they also had to look at the associated talk page and investigate what other editors were identifying as gaps and make sure that they were working collaboratively as a team so that the information was integrated smoothly and that it was appropriate. So the assignment I want to share with you for this example was a student from my spring 2014 class uh, who identified the more, uh, Morris J. Berman oil spill as an article that really needed expansion. In its current state, it only had um, 2,281 characters, so it was pretty small. And as you can even see, it only has a couple of sections and just a few references. So what my student did, taking this small bit, was he went in and expanded it significantly, adding over four, uh, 60, um, 16,000 characters to this particular article. And then he really expanded on the environmental impact that this particular spill had on both the environment and society, adding information about tourism effects, wildlife effects, et cetera. And his work, not only substantially increased this particular article, but he was also able to achieve a spot on the Did You Know section on the main page of Wikipedia. And this allowed him to garner 875 views in one day. A little bit about this particular student was, in my class, he was very reserved and very shy. And so this was his opportunity to allow um, him to highlight his skill and work within that Part of communication he was really comfortable with and see that his voice, his contribution really had meaning and others were very interested. And I've spoken to him since he's taken my class and he's really excited that about this particular contribution and he does add a few things still. Mm -hmm. So some of the things kind of that we got out of assignment two. One, you know, this, this particular way of adding content, it really deepens your course learning. So it's a way for those students to really to look at applying that information and knowledge, integrating it with content that they already understand, and pushing it beyond just the memorization part. They are actually moving up Bloom's, tri uh, Bloom's taxonomy, getting at that higher order of learning. This also allows them to examine different forms of writing. As an encyclopedic form, there's no room for argumentative framework. And so really focusing on what are those facts and how do I substantiate those facts with content and references that are reliable to my field. It also still gives them that room to practice paraphrasing. And this is something that our students struggle with continuously. Um, there's that issue of, pay, of of plagiarism that we have to address consistently um, and this just keeps them extra layers of working toward it. It also allows them to highlight and see how prevalent sometimes plagiarism is in all forms of communication that we deal with and making sure that we're giving credit where credit's due for that intellectual knowledge. Okay. And so the last part of the project was actually um, something that I had integrated throughout, and that was critique and review of uh, peers' work. And so this particular piece was something um, I felt very strongly that I wanted my students to gain a better understanding of, of um, providing substantive and formative feedback uh, to their peers to continually help them improve the content that was being added to elevate the articles that we were as a class working on, but then also to help them see and reflect on whether their writing was also working toward those common goals. Um, this was also to give them some exposure to the publication process. So as non-science majors, it didn't matter where they were going. They were going to be producing content in some form and having to have it reviewed and meet guidelines that were required for that particular piece. And so because Wikimedia has some specific guidelines for how you're to add content, this was just another layer for them. Um, so the example I'm getting ready to show you is from one of my students who is extremely enthusiastic and she completely surprised me with what she did. Um, I, 
I can't even like, every time I look at this, I'm so amazed. Uh, but she really took this upon herself as not only a class assignment, but she felt that it was her duty to help her classmates not only achieve a higher grade in the class, but to make sure that the content was that was available um, to others was of the best quality that they could produce. So she took the outline from the rubric that I had provided, and she placed this in the sandbox of the student's talk page. And she really did a great job of going in and giving more information. So doing that praise sandwich, this is what you did well, here's what needs to be improved, and this is what I think is still coming up. And to highlight a couple of sections here um, was with the Morris J. Berman article. She specifically says she thought she used great examples, but here's some parts that I think could be elaborated more. You could expand these pieces. Here's some other suggestions that I have. So the students were not only learning from themselves, kind of by giving this feedback, but they were also being able to learn how to reflect on their writing as well and incorporate those changes. And this didn't just last within my students alone, but in fact, my students were um, receiving feedback from other Wikipedia editors, which is really what we want. Um, and I was really excited when I saw Dr. James um, Hellman commented on one of my students' articles, uh, particularly for pertussis. So the student was going in, he did some evaluation, he saw that there was uh, some terminology or some facts that weren't cited and then saw some discrepancy with a particular reference. And so he actually deleted that reference. This is when Dr. James came in and said, no, those two references weren't inaccurate, it was just a different side to the story. So this provided this opportunity for us as a class to talk about how scientists can come to two different conclusions on the same idea, and then how do you address that in an encyclopedic framework. So instead of removing one side, rather present both sides so that the reader can gain and, and, and decide on their own what information they feel is, is reliable, as well as giving them opportunities of other places to go with that information. So when I look back at assignment three, that, that third part of the critique, um, my students were really able to test their content knowledge in this section. So they were forced not only to understand the articles that they were developing, but they also had to apply that to what the other articles and disturbances their student, their classmates were working on. This also is an area where they can work on netiquette. So how do you communicate with someone that you're not going to see face to face? How can you eloquently but clearly and concisely deliver suggestions that don't come off snarky but actually have a purpose? And finally, like the collaborative part of this. The other piece here that I found was really important is that this, this particular part of the assignment allowed my students to gain a sense of belonging to the field, um, seeing that they could participate in a conversation, even if it was outside of their major, um, and it would build a relationship with science um, and provide and the process of knowledge construction. And as a scientist, I find that making that connection with someone who is in a different major is so crucial. Science is everything of us. It's our lives, and if you don't have that appreciation and you don't think you contribute, then I find that they tend to not think it's important. They're not interested. This was a way to elevate their literacy in that area. Um, so with any assignment, there's good and there's bad. And so first I'm gonna tell you the good stuff. Um, I had um, several students, and still to this day, that they'll, they'll comment, these are the, some of the skills that they found for this assignment. One, it had purpose. They felt like their assignment was not going to just be a term paper that ended in my release basket at the end of the semester. This was something long lasting and they could show off to their family and their friends. They were also able to learn something new, not just on the course content, but also a skill, a skill in writing, a skill in working on a digital platform. And then finally, it expanded their knowledge and their ability to determine if information was reliable and accurate. So now they had this tool in order to discern what reliable from unreliable. And so, in fact, given a choice of the different technologies we use in my classroom, 23% of my students over four semesters said Wikipedia was their favorite and they would use it in the future. And this was compared to Google Drive, which Google tools that did get the higher percent of likes, um, and then also TED Ed Lessons. 
but still, I have students that accost me in my hallway and run in my office and say, Dr. Becky, did you see what I added <laughs> on different topics? Okay, so the not so good. Um, as with anything, as I said, you, you get likes and dislikes. And so for this particular one, um, students were not happy um, when someone tinkered with their things, they, didn't, uh, they weren't comfortable with their writing, uh, and they found that it was difficult to find reliable references. All of these pieces are valid points, but these are all aspects that our students need to do anyway. And so they have to be able to communicate, whether it's writing, speaking, using visuals, or using technology. They have to be able to work in group settings. Life is one big collaborative group project. And so if we can't work as a group, what are we gonna do for the rest of our lives? Mm -hmm. And then second, you have to be able to go through and find those sources exhaust all possibilities even if it's going to the particular researcher and asking for that content and so while these are all i find these are all important reasons to address i now at the beginning of my semesters i address all of these topics so they don't come up at the end and i keep relaying to them why this is important and crucial um, that they that we do address these issues why it's going to be difficult for them So all of these ideas, all of these, these assignments, these are things, reasons and outcomes for why I use Wikipedia in my own classroom and kind of why I continue to see the benefits. Um, using this has allowed my students to demonstrate their expertise in a topic, how they participate in teaching others, uh, and they also move from that uninformed uh, consumers to active researching editors. So, my, these are some of my suggestions if you decide to include Wikipedia in your own classroom. Um, these are include like coming up with some goals that you want to meet for the class and providing really clear expectations and rubrics. As Helene said at the beginning, there's, there's a little bit of a, a learning curve with Wikipedia, um, but the Wikied and the resources they provide help you overcome those, that, um, that learning curve. You as, a, as an instructor, if you say what you really want, that also has a layer to help the students uh, achieve better skills. Um, and also proceed in, chaps, in steps, participate and check in with them. Um, I'm a really strong believer of having these smaller projects that build to a larger piece at the, at the end. Um, and I also think that it's important to be that participant working with the students so you can foresee any kind of issues that might come up. If you have any questions for me, I've also provided my content. Um, I am I, on Wikipedia as B Carmichael, um, or you can contact me at my email address, which is B-C-A-R-M-I-1 at LSU. Thanks. Thanks, Becky. All right, thank Thanks. you, Becky. We did have one question in the chat, Becky. How many students were enrolled in your courses when you were working on your courses? Okay, so I, I actually have a pretty small class each time. So um, my class tops out at 20. Um, and so I usually average about 18 students per semester. I do have other classes here at LSU. Um, so since I have been working with this um, in, since 2011, we've had, I broke this down, 531 students over 26 classes. The maximum in those classes has been around 40 students per class, 35 to 40, excuse me. And that's actually a good question. So, so we, as an organization, um, so we, we actually do recommend that if we're going to do a Wikipedia assignment, um, that it's in a, um, a smaller class, actually, that we find that Wikipedia assignments work best in those classes. That's not to say that we actually don't support some larger classes, but we recommend, um, you know, sometimes a, a bit of an altered assignment for, for larger classes. Yeah, so the average, I think the average size of classes that we support is 25 to 50 students. Yeah. And if it's more than 50, what we would do is we would just have a conversation with you about what kinds of TA support do you have? You're working with one TA, multiple TAs, are there different sections of your course? And how yeah. can we scale an assignment to make sure that you feel comfortable evaluating your student work yeah. along with your students feeling comfortable with the technology? So it's really just wanting to make a good experience yeah. for you and your students, not really any other reasons than that. Yeah. We don't want anyone to feel overwhelmed. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. we didn't have any other questions in the chat. Yeah. I think this any, is good. any other any other questions? 
So yeah, we're we can, gonna, we can gonna... stay and chat. We've got 10 more minutes if people have more questions. Oh yeah, we have one question, All right. Carla. Hi, Carla. She says, how much class time did you devote to the project? This is for Becky, I'm assuming. Did students work alone or in small groups? And how much time did you as the instructor spend grading and with feedback? So, um, it's a great question. My, yeah, I like this question. So my course, my class meets twice a week, 80 minutes. Um, I devote one class myself to give my students a, um, a workshop on editing Wikipedia. I take this, the student training that Wikipedia, WikiEd had developed, um, I give that to them as a pre-class assignment, and then they come to class and we, we look up topics, they come, or they come with a topic they want to look at. We look up that topic in Wikipedia, we find an article, and then I have them do some test edits. And this is for me um, also to see, are they, are they on the right track with my course? And they understanding what topics are relevant. Um, but then also I can work with them on the types of edits that they do. I then have three check-ins. So they get their their free topic, if you will, on an article of their choosing that's still related to the class. And then they have two articles that they get to do that are relevant to a topic that they're gonna lecture on in my class. Um, for the most part, my students work individually, though sometimes they will pair up on one article and if they do so, I make sure that they're both making substantial contributions. So, and that makes it nice because I can see who added what content to an article based on their username. Um, as far as me grading, I find that this takes me around the same as if I would have to grade um, some papers. So, I, I've set myself a little trick. I actually set myself a timer and I set it around like this, between six and eight minutes, and I give myself some time to scan content that they've added. And if that buzz is off, then I, I go back and I look at my rubric, and, I, um, and then I give them a score, I go back and I look at it. So it takes me about mm, maybe two and a half hours sometimes for to grade their contributions. Um, another trick that I do to speed that up is the students have a user page and an associated talk page. They also have a sandbox. Their sandbox is their area where they can play and develop that content. Within their user sandbox, I have them outline the content that they include by article. So it says article one, I have them make a, a little brief summary. Um, something like, uh, I selected this particular article because this is the content I added and why this reference I included was reliable because. So I have them answer some questions and then I have them block it out. And that's also a way that speeds up my grading as I can go through my rubric and see Did they complete all the pieces of the assignment and then I can dig more into the actual content. Yeah, one thing that when I work with instructors to help them design their assignments, this is a really common question is, well, how do I evaluate student work, right? Because this doesn't look like a traditional assignment where they're turning in a paper to me at the end of the term, and I'm able to grade and, and return it. So one thing that we found is similar to what Becky's done is we recommend that students do like a, a two page reflection paper where they talk about, okay, what article did I work on? What did that article critique look like? So how did I identify that that article was missing content? And what did that look like? And then also, why did my contributions create value for the overall improvement of the article and then what specifically did I do to contribute to the article and so students can print out similar before and after screenshots for you um, but again all the wiki ed, the, the wiki ed dashboard actually tracks all the edits your students make so you're able to if you really want to dig in and see every iterative change that your students are making you can dig in and see all those edit contributions and that edit history through the dashboard through the course page that I help you set up. Um, but that takes, like Becky said, that takes more time, right? You wanna really dig in and see, but it, it's often helpful to have the students summarize their own work for you. Um, and if there's a point in the term where they're maybe gonna move their work live and you wanna review their drafts, you can say, okay, mid, uh, midnight on Tuesday, your draft is due in your sandbox, and I'm gonna go ahead and take a look and I'll offer comments, right? And you'll have comments by next week, and you can go through and, and kind of what Becky did is, is take a look at that draft in their sandbox, Space, go to the talk page and say, all right, well, here's 
some comments that I have for you and for the draft that you're doing before you move it live. And so those are things that we can talk about um, while we design an assignment or if you have questions during the assignment, talk to Helene and we're happy to, to help you kind of come up with a, a strategy for that. Yeah. And I'm happy to share to any of the, the kind of the tips that I've done in the class, even some examples. Um, the dashboard is actually amazing because I can have very quick access to both my students. It also is a way for me to highlight and point them to resources that are going to help so that I don't have to always have these conversations in class. I do try to give like five minute check ins every couple weeks to ask my students how they're progressing. And the other thing that I don't think that we've mentioned is or you kind of touched on Samantha, um, is if you want to see when your student has added content, it's, it's timestamp. And so I can tell if my student freaked out the night before it was due and just tried to dump a whole bunch of stuff in, or if they've been progressively working on something. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also if they've been talking back and forth to other editors. So that makes it nice too. Yeah, and, and again, as both Becky and Samantha mentioned, we, we have this dashboard tool, which is kind of like a, Kind of our version of a blackboard or moodle sort of kind of a course management system that essentially um enables you to kind of quickly navigate to all these different things that we're talking about the user sandbox the talk pages their contributions when they were done um so um and you can always access that on wikipedia but our dashboard kind of cool. mainstreams mm -hmm. uh uh or streamlines excuse me um a lot of that information yeah we had another really interesting question i'll i'll We'll see what we think about this. So here's the question. <laughs> what would you think of imagining some kind of grading by the Wikipedia community, like the live RC patrol? So I'll, oh. I'll take a stab really quickly at this, which is just the Wikipedia community is all volunteers. And they're already, you know, every single, almost every single article that's been contributed to Wikipedia has been written by a volunteer. So Wikiad is, is not trying to ask more volunteer time for a program that, that you and we are running in your classroom with your students. Um, so that, that's like my really quick reply is that if, if we were gonna do something like that, that's asking more time for potentially 5,000 students that's getting put on a volunteer community, which is already overburdened. So that's like my really quick un, you know, reply. But I also think it would be a little bit dangerous because they're not coming at it from an educational perspective, right? They're coming at it from a pure information validity perspective. So instead of thinking it as a teachable moment, I think that that could also be possibly um, not the, the type of feedback that you would want. I, well, yeah, the, the other, oh, sorry, go ahead, Becky. Oh, I was gonna say, I, I can see this, this pros and cons too, because I've, I've, that's something I've experienced. Um, not that I asked someone to grade my content, but this is where I feel like getting your students to do some peer review, that mm -hmm. takes out some of the work. And in fact, that's kind of what my students are doing right now. I told them, once you all have your feedback, your peer review, peer review feedback in, I'm coming in after that, because that also helps me. But we've had some um, volunteers that have worked with us directly for some of the courses at Louisiana State University, and they've been amazing. They've added uh, suggestions, though they did not give a grade, and because of restrictions on how much grading you can do that's visible on Wikipedia, I highly recommend no grades on Wikipedia, just feedback. So eliciting feedback from some of those editors is, is phenomenal if you have somebody who wants to work with you. Now I've also had someone who is not an expert, but is very passionate, and sometimes that they can, it can, um, it can cause your, scare your students to the point where they're like, I don't want to work on this particular topic um, because they're just constantly reverting edits without any explanation. Um, and I look at that, try to look at that in very positive of, okay, so now you've experienced someone who you have to, you have to work with at some point. How can you start a conversation so that they know and you support, this is why I made these edits. I'll let Helene yeah, finish up. Yeah, yeah one just, more minute. yeah, sorry, just, just, just a couple of things. So, so yeah, just um, following up with Samantha and Becky said, um, so yeah, very important point that Becky mentioned is that there's a lot of privacy issues actually related to putting grades, student grades on Wikipedia. Um, so that's actually something that there's actually some legal um, implications there that, um, 
is, um, especially actually in Canada, that, that you cannot, you can't do for students. Um, so that's that's number one. Um, number two, uh, what what can happen though on Wikipedia? So of course we get this editor feedback, and you know, and as Becky mentioned, students can critique each other's work. But what Wikipedia does have, not grades per se, but um, each article does have a rating. Have, it has a classification that goes from. Um, Featured article, good article, A, B, C, D, and all the way down to um, you know what's called a start or stub article, which are these very very beginner articles. So what can happen is when a student, um, you know, if a student drastically improves an article, they can take that rating, let's say from a, a C to a B, you know, um, or so you know from a D to a C, whatever whatever it is, right? So so something like that can happen in Wikipedia, and actually even the student can actually change that classification. I think it's only when you go from B to A and up that you need um, some official, fee, review. A, a fee, official review and official approval. Um, so, so stuff like that can happen on Wikipedia too. Um, yeah, so just to, to follow mm -hmm. up on that. Yeah, that's good. Any, yeah. any other last question before I think we're out of time here, but any other? Any other no, questions? that was it. That was really wow. interesting. Really well, interesting question. Well, well, and we're perfectly on time for the 1101. All right, well, thank well, you. In California. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us again today. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you so much, Becky, um, for joining us. And um, again, so this session was recorded. Uh, it will be made available at some point. We can't, um, we don't know exactly when that, that will happen, but it will be available. And we can notify everybody here when that recording is available. Um, again, thank you so much. If you have any questions, please follow up with me, Samantha, or Becky. Yeah. Thanks, right. guys. Hope everybody's a happy good day. Friday. Yeah, happy Friday. Good weekend, everybody. Thank you.